Blessings to you and good morning. I'm Matt Henderson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Clarksville, Georgia, and I'm so pleased to be with you for worship today. During this time of encouraged distancing, we continue to offer our worship services online and hope that this online presence suffices under the current circumstances. We know that even though we are gathered each in our own homes, that the Spirit of Christ unites us in a way that is powerful, meaningful, and important. While it's likely you're joining us on Facebook Live, as the majority of our viewers do, know that you can also watch us on YouTube, which may be helpful, especially for those watching or having a uh, smart TV or streaming devices, as YouTube is offered there. We even have it set to play at 11 o'clock each Sunday, and you can check your email for further information. We're halfway through our current sermon series called Extraordinary, The Incredible Impact Christ Has Had on the World. Again, it's based on the book who is this man by John Ortberg? We're taking these weeks to consider the unsurpassed influence Jesus and the Christian church have had on our society throughout history. And today, I'll be covering the topic of Christ's remarkable humility. If you'd like to prepare your Bibles, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, also a reflection from Psalm 69. Our gospel will be in Matthew chapter 20 and then James chapter 4. You can find those readings listed each week with a link to our online Bible in our emailed newsletter, also in the comment section below. I have begun to hear from many of you about our next sermon series, questions the church asks, but I'd love to receive some more submissions. So send in your questions, those that you think would make a good sermon subject, and I'd love to hear from you. Again, a special note I'd like to make if you or anyone you know is experiencing trouble, a hardship, or might need help in any way, especially due to this global health crisis please let me know. Our session is particularly prioritizing its concern for our members and neighbors who might be facing these troubling times alone. We don't know what the help may be, but don't keep it to yourself. Finally, this Memorial Day weekend, we give special honor and recognition to those family and friends who through service to our country gave the ultimate sacrifice. We remember with gratitude those whose lives were lost while defending liberty, oppression, and peace, both domestically and abroad. Today's opening prayer will begin with a brief moment of silence in their honor. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you with gratitude for you have gathered us this morning, gathered us together, and even though we remain distant from one another, your spirit unites and connects us, and for that we are humbled, we are grateful. We pray, O oh God, that this time of worshipful meditation and reflection will be pleasing to you, that you will penetrate into our hearts, O oh God, an appreciation and an awareness of your presence. We pray, O oh God, that all that we do would glorify you. We give you thanks, O oh God, now on this special occasion as we remember, as we honor, as we give thanks for those near and dear to us who through the ultimate gift of 
sacrifice, lost their life in service to this country. We pray, O oh God, that their memory would continue to be honored. We pray, O oh God, for those of us who still mourn, who still carry heavy sorrow and grief over lost loved ones. Be a comfort, O oh God, to them. And may we all continue to appreciate and honor those who put their lives at risk that we might understand freedom, liberty, and, f and all that you promised to us. May we live this life, O oh God, grateful to you and thankful for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This morning during our musical reflections, we've put together some old standards, some favorites of yours and mine. We'll even include the words on the screen that you might join with us in singing in your own homes. Much of how Christ lived ran contrary to the world's ways. Often we hear about how Christ turned everything upside down. And as much influence as Jesus has had on who we are today, both inside and outside the church, there are still many particular attitudes and behaviors that don't seem to make much sense to many people. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, calls it, in fact, foolishness and folly. Yet we consider it life-giving, salvific, redemptive. Hear this encouragement from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Friends, the greatest act of love and compassion was embodied on a foolish cross, a cross that was reserved for the lowest criminals of Roman society. And that humble, sacrificial act has transformed our lives. Some still don't get it. Some mock it. Some fail to receive it. Yet know this. The foolishness of God is wiser than man.
The Psalms are beautiful prayers that the church has used throughout its history. The psalmists have provided for us a wide range of emotion and vulnerability as they have shared their innermost desires and worries, not just to God, but they've allowed us to witness and even participate. While many of the psalms are indeed glorious praises, uplifting worship to God, there's a significant portion that include prayers for God to intervene and rescue. We've all been there with nowhere else to turn than to God. And maybe you're there right now. Let us offer this psalm, Psalm 69, as a prayer for all those facing difficulty and struggle. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the deep, deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out my throat is parched, my eyes grow dim with waiting for God. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord, God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Ransom me because of my enemies. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and the people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. My friends, the Lord does save, and the Lord cares for each of us. The Lord hears the needy and is near to each of us. Friends, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves, people of God, and God will lift you up. For our confession today, let us be mindful of our prideful, selfish tendencies that create distance between ourselves and the way of humble sacrifice that God calls each of us to. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, 
our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, Jesus offers you release of your burdens, forgiveness of sin. Let go. Come to Jesus and be at peace. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Teach me thy patience still with thee. In closer dear company, in work that keeps me sweet and strong, in trust that triumphs over all, in hope that sends a shining ray for down the future's broadening way. In peace that only Thou canst give, with Thee, O Master, let me live. Jesus was not a great man. Not as the world defines greatness, and especially the world Jesus entered into. No. No, Jesus was not a great man, and the world is a better place because of him. Jesus lived an example of humility, remarkable humility, sacrificial, vulnerable, honest humility, and charged his disciples to do the same. The way that he called them into ministry, the way that he lived his life, the way that he died, all marked by remarkable humility. Humility is seen by many in this world as a sign of weakness. And while Christianity lifts it up as a virtue, yet because of Jesus, there is significantly more room and understanding for the humble, selfless way, the remarkable way that Christ invites us to follow. And even for some, the way of humility is the way of a hero. Two Sundays ago, we set aside the day to celebrate moms. Mother's Day is a very appropriate time to honor those who do so much for us. They are our biggest advocates, loudest cheerleaders, strongest supporters. They'll do just about anything for us to be successful and happy in this world. Take, for example, the mother of James and John, the Zebedee brothers. She wants them to be successful, influential, important. But she doesn't understand the world that Jesus is trying to usher in. From Matthew chapter 20. Beginning with verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, 
and kneeling before Jesus, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and they, their great ones, exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Greeks knew what greatness is. And for them, greatness did not involve humility. Philosopher Alistair McIntyre noted that humility was not considered a virtue in that world. Aristotle's great-souled man is extremely proud. He despises honors offered by the common people. He indulges in conspicuous consumption for he likes to own beauty and useless things since they are better marks of his independence. The Roman Empire organized its occupants the way most airlines organize their customers. The most basic distinction being first class and coach. Airlines work hard to reinforce this distinction. First class passengers get to board first. They get to walk through a separate gate featuring a glorious red carpet upon which the rest of us may not tread. They sit nearest the front. They eat on fine china and drink fine wine. Roman society was roughly divided between first class, maybe 2% of the population, and coach those called the rabble. The rabble served an important purpose, as one ancient writer put it. The existence of inferiors is an advantage to superiors since they will be able to point out those over whom they are superior. Occupations in the ancient world were also ordered around rank. The most honorable was to own vast tracts of land and have slaves that work on it. The elite would never do manual labor. Cicero wrote, Vulgar are the means of livelihood of all hired workmen whom we pay for mere manual labor. The French sociologist Marcel Mauss observed that in the ancient world, a wealthy person might give away possessions as a sign of his wealth, but there was always an implied string attached. The receiver was expected to reciprocate. In fact, sometimes just to show off, a rich man might deliberately ruin someone by inviting them to a banquet and then giving him a gift that was so expensive that the recipient would go bankrupt trying to pay it back. Ancient legal conditions were a reflection upon the social status. 
a seemingly common second century legal saying said, one law for the more honorable, another law for the more humble. Or as a British proverb put it in the 19th century, one law for the rich and another for the poor. For example, a Roman citizen could never be crucified. The other official means of execution, decapitation, burning alive, they were obviously equally terminal, but less shameful. Crucifixion was reserved particularly for slaves, known as the slave's punishment. On Jesus' last night, almost the final moments of his life, he was so concerned for his followers to embrace humility that he acted out. Humility is something like a parable. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So we know that and see that he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. We've learned that washing feet was an important part of ancient life. It was an act of hospitality, hygiene, also a religious ritual of cleansing, but it was demeaning. It was done only by slaves. In fact, it was considered so demeaning that it usually fell to the lowest of the slaves in the house, and almost always the Gentile slaves, as a Jewish master would rarely compel a Jewish slave to wash his feet. What type of master are we following? What type of Lord are we called to, called to emulate? Even the words master and Lord seem out of place, for Jesus encouraged his followers to not lord their authority over others. Our Savior died a shameful slave's death and calls for us also to take up our own crosses and follow him. Jesus was invited, surprisingly, to quite a few dinner parties as the Gospels record. And I say surprisingly because he wasn't ever much of a complicit, polite guest. He was always stirring the pot, causing a scene, pointing out some cultural rub with the kingdom of God. He would chide the hosts for offering him the seat of honor, calling them to reserve, reverse their thinking. Don't throw a, don't throw a banquet for your friends, he'd say. Not for those who you know can pay you back. No. Instead, go out into the streets. Invite the rabble, the common folk, the poor, those who can't pay you back. Then you'll know that you are pure in heart when you act sacrificially for the pure benefit of someone else without expecting something in return. Weak. Timid. A pushover. That's what the world considers of the humble. Yet Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Humility is seen by many still in this world as a sign of weakness. But because of Jesus, there is significantly more room and understanding for the humble, selfless way, the remarkable way that Christ invites us to follow. For some, the way of humility is the way of a hero. The change in understanding hasn't been quick, but I believe it's still occurring there is a deeper appreciation for the least of these, the last of these. Have they become first, first-class citizens? Maybe not. But there continues to be a slow turn towards seeing humility as a powerful force for good in the world. 
Who are the heroes of this age? In whom do we place our admiration and trust? What traits do we value in our leaders? The strong, commanding, forceful, authoritarian no longer drives the universal model of hero. At the turn of the century, Time magazine categorized the 100 most influential, remarkable people in the last 100 years. Albert Einstein was listed as number one. Einstein, not an overly domineering fellow. In fact, the seminary I attended in Princeton is adjacent to where Einstein lived, where he studied and worked, and his home just a few doors down from the main campus entry. And it's said that he lived a very humble life. A single unadorned light bulb illuminated his living room, and he always meekly greeted town folk as he walked along the sidewalks. Time Magazine in that same issue, under the category of heroes and icons, which they defined as people who exemplify courage, selflessness, exuberance, superhuman ability and amazing grace. Isn't that a wonderful collection of uh, heroic attributes? Well, they list among several others of heroes, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, Anne Frank, Rosa Parks, Helen Keller. None of these set out to be influential. None of these set out to be heroes. But nonetheless, by putting the needs of others for seeking the way of service and often with great humility and selflessness, made this world a better place. Australia's Macquarie University did a research project exploring how humility went from a despised weakness to now an admired social virtue. They say the conclusion was clear. The modern Western fondness for humility almost certainly derives from the peculiar impact on Europe of the Judeo-Christian worldview, Jesus. This is not a religious conclusion, for Macquarie is a public university. This is a purely historical finding. So let us consider, friends, what type of master are we following? What type of Lord are we called to emulate? Again, even the words master and Lord seem out of place. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. Want to be greatest in the kingdom? Seek the role of a servant. And listen in conclusion to this exhortation from James chapter 4. God oppresses the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Jesus was not a great man. Not as the world defines greatness. Especially the world Jesus entered into. No, Jesus was not a great man. The world is a better place. Humble yourselves. Show this world your servant heart. Draw near to God in humility. And God will exalt you. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for giving us the example of humility, remarkable humility. May we, as we seek to follow the humble one, seek the ways that we might serve each other, 
that we might seek out the least of these, that we might put them first, ourselves last in all. May we, by being gentle, meek, show the power and the foolishness that you offer to us as we surrender and follow you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. that God longs to hear us, is near us, calling for us to come home. Let us return home now in prayer. Almighty God, you are a loving Father who loves to give his children good gifts. We pray, O oh God, for those good gifts to be poured out upon this world for those we love, for those that we see in need, for those who are struggling. May the abundance of your grace and love, O oh God, be poured out. You who have given us amazing blessings, give us the eyes to see just where those blessings can be shared. We pray for this world, its hurt, its pain, its illness, and we pray for healing and reconciliation. For those among us, O oh God, fighting illness and disease and injury, we pray for your healing hand to be upon them. For those, O oh God, 
facing struggles, difficulty, uncertainty. We pray for your guidance, for your comfort, for your peace. As we draw near to you, O oh God, we pray that your spirit drawing near to us would be experienced in transformative ways. Touch our lives and show us how we can touch and make a difference in the lives of others. We offer all this humbly with the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We're here to um, honor and recognize our graduates as they have accomplished much in their school career and are now moving on to uh, even grander things. Helen and Grace, we are indeed proud of you and your accomplishments. We um, are proud to claim you as our own. And uh, on behalf of the church, we are wanting to present to you this a uh, jeweled cross, a jeweled cross, a, a nice necklace cross, at least, and um, I don't know about these things, but nonetheless, um, we are so proud to have been part of your life, hopefully, um, at least a small part of building a foundation for which you to build your uh, adult life of faith upon, and um, let us offer this prayer of blessing for you all. Almighty God, we pray your blessing upon Elowen and Grace as they graduate from one stage of their life to another. May you continue to walk with them and guide them. You have given them great knowledge. So now show them, O oh God, how to use it wisely and how to find a way to make this world a better place. Grant them faith and the courage to put purpose in every day and show them, O oh God, how to serve you in meaningful and effective ways. May their education, O oh God, their knowledge and their skill lead to their true fulfillment as they learn to do your will. And may they ever be aware that in everything they do, knowledge comes from learning, yet wisdom comes from you. We entrust them to you, O oh God, until they return back to us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Congratulations, girls. Blessings to you. I was there on the day that you were changed. You were scared, unprepared for the heartbreak. Everything you knew faded out of you. Stole a piece of you. One of the major accomplishments from high school for me was getting to participate in the one act competitions for drama and winning uh, region and going to state for, for both my 11th and 12th grade year, and in 11th grade at region winning best supporting actress. I've also been able to go to all state course every year for all six years, which is so much fun and that was probably one of my favorite things about high school. I'm going to Piedmont College in the fall where I'm going to be majoring in music performance. Wrap up video. Um, I guess the 
the review of high school, the thing I've been most involved in was theater and dance. Um, I was the president of the Best Band Troupe at the high school, and I danced at Clarksville School of Dance. And um, this year, I was the valedictorian, which was cool, and the star student, which was also cool. Um, and I found out the other day that I am a Georgia scholar, which is also fun. And um, I went to Governor's Honors last summer for a theater performance. So that was also a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go to the University of Georgia in the fall, the Honors College, and right now I'm planning to study political science, but it could change, so who knows? But yeah. Before I know you're braver. Oh, no, you don't have to be afraid. Together we'll face it. So don't ever stop, no matter what, cause you're gonna make it. Friends, Jesus was not a great man, not as the world defines greatness. Jesus was humble, calls us to put others first and to humbly pick up our own cross day after day. May we all seek the humble route the way that Christ led as an example for us. And in so doing, show this world that they are loved, cared for, valuable, important, that God has given his own son as a sacrifice of love and that we live in that sacrifice each day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and bring you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you.